hello and welcome to episode 61 of Not Reserving Judgment, a podcast about the latest triumphs, intrigues, and outrages in Canadian constitutional law. I'm Josh DeHaas, counsel with the CCF. I'm Christine Van Gein, the CCF's litigation director. And I'm Joanna Barron, executive director of the CCF. In today's episode, I'm going to tell you about a recent decision from the Quebec Court of Appeal about racial profiling and random police stops. I'll discuss a claim by a library worker in BC who says she's being discriminated against because her new work schedule prevents her from picking up her kid from daycare on time. And we'll share our bad legal takes of the week where we take a lighthearted look at some legal opinions that didn't quite land. But first, I'm going to walk you through some proposed changes to the Alberta Bill of Rights and explain what those do and don't mean. So, uh, On Monday, Alberta's Justice Minister introduced Bill 24, which would amend the Alberta Bill of Rights to protect the right not to be coerced into medical treatment, including vaccines, enhanced property rights, and uh, add gun rights to the bill. So before we get into the details of what's changed, it's important to kind of understand how the statutory Bill of Rights works. So it reads a lot like the Charter. It protects fundamental freedoms like speech, assembly, religion, and equality. And it applies to the Alberta legislature itself. So they can't make laws that are inconsistent with the Bill of Rights unless those are demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. And government actors are not supposed to apply laws in ways that would be inconsistent with the Bill of Rights. But unlike the Charter, which is part of the Constitution and therefore really, really difficult to amend, the Bill of Rights is just a regular statute. So it could be repealed by a future government as long as they have a majority of the votes. And it also, in this version, would have a notwithstanding clause, which means that individual laws could be exempted from the requirement if the legislature writes that into those laws themselves. So critics have seized on these facts to say that, you know, this Bill of Rights amendment isn't really valuable or that it's just sort of virtue signaling by Premier Daniel Smith, who has to face a leadership review soon, even though she just what a majority government because Alberta's UCP is unusually hostile to its leaders. But repealing the Bill of Rights or parts thereof, or even just using the notwithstanding clause in the Bill of Rights, it's it's actually much easier said than done. So just to give an example, like a future NDP provincial government that, say, wanted to mandate a new COVID vaccine for all Alberta public sector workers and all school children, Um, would be slowed down by the Bill of Rights if they tried to do that. So, you know, they could they could uh, amend the Bill of Rights or use the notwithstanding clause. But to do so, the legislature would first need to be recalled if it's not sitting and they would need unanimous consent, which presumably the opposition UCP in that situation wouldn't grant. And it would need to go through three readings and committees. So it just wouldn't happen overnight. And that government would need to endure months of scrutiny and public debate about whether it's really a good idea. And by the time that's over, you know, they might've lost the public support for that vaccine mandate. So what the critics also don't acknowledge is that it's it's really gonna be most helpful in, in emergencies because that's when the panic sets in and governments pass laws that go too far. So the new version of the bill would also explicitly acknowledge this in the new preamble. It would say, you know, whereas human rights and fundamental freedoms are foundational to Alberta society, including during times of emergency, blah, blah, blah. So, okay, so let's talk about the new newly protected rights. There's there's a few of them. The current act protects the right to enjoyment of property and the right not to be deprived thereof except by due process of law. But the new Bill of Rights would have the following wording. It would protect the right to enjoyment of property and the right not to be deprived thereof, except to the extent authorized by law and except by due process of law and the right not to be subject to a taking of property, except to the extent authorized by law and where just compensation is provided. So that's a similar wording to the Fifth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, and it makes explicit what is already part of the common law, which is that if the government takes your property, you're entitled not just to due process, but also to just compensation. And, you know, this could make governments uh, think more carefully about expropriating your land. For example, in Wilmot, Ontario, where farmers are having their land expropriated for a pittance, maybe if that happened in Alberta, they'd be entitled to more compensation. 
I don't really know that for sure, but I think that's the type of thing it would it would do. In terms of medical care, so the Bill of Rights would add the following passage. Uh, it would protect, quote, the right of the individual with capacity not to be subjected to or coerced into receiving medical care, medical treatment, or medical procedure without the consent of that individual unless that individual is likely to cause substantial harm to that individual or to others. And it says, notwithstanding Clause H, so in spite of Clause H, the right of the individual with capacity not to be subjected to or coerced into receiving a vaccine without the consent of that individual. And the section is really interesting because it makes clear that vaccine mandates really are out in a lot of settings. And the key word that uh, proves that is the word coerced. So if you're going to be disciplined by, say, your provincial employer, like a hospital or a public school for not getting the vaccine, I think that would be um, a, vi a violation of the act. And the section also clarifies the standard by which the province could um, force people, for example, you know, drug addicts or people with severe mental illness. And it would, it makes clear that it would be possible to do that if the individual is causing substantial harm to themselves or others. And lots of libertarians will look at the part where it says substantial harm to themselves and be a little bit wary of that. I'm a little bit wary of that part too. The counter argument, of course, and we're having this big debate in society right now is that, you know, some people lose capacity to make decisions about whether to keep using fentanyl or not to take schizophrenia medication. Um, and a lot of people argue they pose such an extreme risk to themselves that they need interventions. So this would at least continue to make that possible. Uh, finally, they've added the right to acquire, keep, and use firearms in accordance with law. And obviously, the federal government would retain their criminal law power to regulate guns for criminal purposes. But where I think this might come into play is, for example, if municipalities try to ban certain firearms that are not otherwise banned, something that you know happens here in Ontario, um, or if Alberta decides, or if Alberta is asked to like participate in the federal gun buyback, this might come into play. So, anyway, lots of criticism of this of this proposal from left and fr from right, and I'll go through that pretty quickly. Um, First, Smith is being attacked on the right by David Parker, who tweeted that changes to the Bill of Rights still allows employers to discriminate based on vaccine status. And I don't think that's true in general. I think that's actually wrong. Um, and it, again, it comes down to that word coercion. There obviously would be some exceptions and it would be challenged in court, so we don't know for sure how it would play out. But I think he's basically wrong on that. He also points out that the bill leaves the delineation of rights to judges. And that's fair criticism because the bill would add a section similar to section one of the charter, which reads uh, in part, the rights and freedoms recognized and declared by this act are subject only to such reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic Alberta. And that would in some cases potentially let judges green light things like vaccine mandates, but the government would have a much higher bar to jump over than they currently do. So, uh, Parker's also upset that there's no, quote, statement absolute right respected by all major world religions of parents over their children. Some grammar issues going on there. Um, but I'm assuming that relates to the more widespread criticism of, of the fact that the Bill of Rights doesn't protect parental parents related to things like, you know, gender transition. And we all know Smith is, of course, creating some new protections on that bill, some age limits for things like uh, medical transition or whether through drugs or surgeries, and that's very controversial. Uh, but it shouldn't be a surprise that this is not in the Bill of Rights, partly because it is so controversial and a Bill of Rights is supposed to be things that all Albertans essentially agree with. Um, and also because, uh, you know, Smith has said before that transgender people deserve to be treated with dignity and equality and respect. And so we shouldn't be surprised that the Bill of Rights continues to protect that. Um, as for criticism from the left, uh, NDP leader Nahed Nenshi spoke to reporters before, um, before the bill was introduced, actually, and his complaint was that the bill is not going to protect women's reproductive rights or the ability to put renewable energy projects on their own property, which are kind of odd things to expect to see in a Bill of Rights, if you ask me. Um, so, Joanne and Christine, you two literally wrote the book on how Canadians panicked and governments imposed unreasonable 
restrictions on nearly every right and freedom during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm talking about pandemic panic available in fine bookstores everywhere. Uh, Joanna, maybe I'll start with you. Do, you. do you think this Bill of Rights could have stopped some of the excesses that we saw? Or is, you know, David Parker right that it's not going to do all that much in the next pandemic? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I think pandemic panics are real and moral panics, the, the nature of them is that they make us lose our sense. Having said that, I do think the symbolic impact of laws matters. I think having explicit delineation that certain laws are protected um, does, you know, count for something. Having said that, as you'll remember, Josh, because you wrote a series of blogs for the CCF in the summer of 2020 called Can They Really Do That? Which uh, this will be one of those like time hop things that people will be surprised to hear. But at that time, remember when everyone was posting black squares and making whipped coffees and watching uh, Tiger King? It also was the position of our prime minister that we would never have vaccine mandates. Unthinkable. Of course, we won't have vaccine mandates until all of a sudden that completely changed in every province, of course, including Alberta. Um, so, so yes, we should be skeptical. Um, so I think this is mostly symbolic politics and I don't think it will be any type of airtight defense in the case of the next moral panic. But what do you think, Christine? Are you more optimistic? I mean, if they have a section one, they give they're giving themselves a lot of uh, get out of jail free here. Uh, the other issue, I think, and this is maybe a positive, is it's really important to to remember this is not like a new idea. Quebec has their own version of the charter. They have the Quebec Charter, and it was actually the Quebec Charter that was used in the Shaoli case to find that the prohibition on private insurance was a violation of the rights of Quebec patients. So, I mean, it was useful in that regard for, for Quebec. And so, uh, frankly, it would have been more useful if the Canadian charter was used because then we would have a consensus across the country. Uh, but you know, you maybe take what you can get. And if you could, um, better preserve the rights of Albertans using the Alberta bill of rights, uh, I mean, the benefit then is to the people of Alberta and they have better protections. So, uh, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm of two minds about it. Uh, I, I'll turn now to my headline, which is about a case that I've been tracking for a few years now called Quebec and Luamba. And it involves random police stops, which until now were deemed to be constitutional. Random stops are permitted by statute in Quebec they're permitted by Section 636 of the Highway Traffic Code in Ontario. They're permitted by Section 216 of the Highway Traffic Act. And these are what we believe to be codified, what, what has until now believed to be codifications of a common law ancillary police power to randomly stop vehicles, even in the absence of a reasonable suspicion of an offense as long as the police are doing these random stops for the purpose of general traffic regulation, like checking for driver's licenses. So as I said, it's long been believed by the public and by police that there is a common law power to conduct random stops. There was a 1980 case called Deadman and the Queen. Uh, it's pre-charter. And in that case, the court considered random stops as a part of the ride program, which is, I think everyone knows what that is. Uh, and, and in that case, the court, the Supreme Court said that the police do have a common law power to do these types of random organized stops. There was then a 1990 case, and so now the charter is involved. And that case is called R. N. Le Duce, and it involved a statutory power to conduct random stops outside of the ride program. And in that case, the Supreme Court found that random stops were a violation of the Section 9 guarantee to be free from arbitrary detention, but that random stops are justified under Section 1 of the Charter. And I think that there probably is public support for the idea that there is this police power to do random stops so that police can do their jobs. I mean, it has long been how the police have conducted themselves. Uh, and But the question of whether or not they actually have this common law power becomes an issue in this case. And I'm going to explain that. And I think 
for there to be public support for the common law power and the statutory power to be used in a way that isn't abused by police, uh, that isn't discriminatory, random actually needs to mean random. It can't just mean black, which is essentially what Mr. Luamba was arguing in this case. So he challenged the statutory uh, power to do random stops. When he brought this case, he was 22 years old. He's a black young man from Montreal who says he had been stopped by Quebec police nearly 12 times without reason, and none of these stops resulted in a ticket. And I mean, when you put that in context, it is horrible, and it seems pretty suspicious to me. I mean, think about your own life. And how often you have been randomly stopped by police, not as part of the ride program. They just pull you over uh, and say, let me just see your license. I, I don't think it has ever happened to me, not a single time. And I have, you know, been driving around late at night, plenty of times driving around downtown. But the police have never randomly stopped me to ask for my, my driver's license. And at just 22 years old, this guy is stopped nearly 12 times. If he got his driver's license at 16 years old, that is twice a year. Uh, I don't know. Joanna, have you ever been randomly stopped? Uh, no, I'm assuming being stopped because my license plate sticker, which I guess aren't a thing anymore, That's was expired. doesn't count. No, I know. No, no I have Josh, what, what about you? So I actually have. Um... I'll tell this story really quick. So when I was like about 17, uh, all I lived in a small town and all I would do is like drive around with my friends and get into various trouble, but nothing actually like illegal. Um, and there was a period of like a few weeks where I got stopped like over and over again, I think f five times in a row, just completely randomly. And it obviously wasn't random. They thought I was doing something wrong or they were just like this, these teenagers are out too late at night driving around. And it was you feel really violated when that happens. Like, I think I was targeted because of my age, which is, you know, one thing, but to be targeted because of your race would be just so dispiriting and, and shouldn't be going on. So anyway, so rare, know, rare exception, but as an adult, never, never. Like we don't stopped. know why he was stopped because the police say it was random, but the idea that you've been stopped, you know, 12 times, like you're being stopped twice a year, by the time you're 22, you've been stopped 12 times. I mean, I, I think it's pretty suspicious. Um, so he he thought it was suspicious too. Uh, he challenged the provision of the Quebec Highway Code. And the Quebec Superior Court found that the police power of random stops outside of those organized spot check programs like uh, RIDE, they found that that power is unconstitutional. And the Superior Court Justice wrote in this at the lower court back uh, uh, two years ago in October of 2022, the judge wrote that racial profiling does exist. It's not a laboratory constructed abstraction. It is a reality that weighs heavily on black communities. It manifests itself in particular with black drivers of motor vehicles. And the judge said evidence has shown over time that arbitrary power granted to the police to make roadside stops without cause became quote, for them, for, sorry, for some of them, a vector, even a safe conduit for racial profiling against the black community. And the rule of law thus becomes a breach through which this sneaky form of racism rushes in. And the Quebec government appealed the ruling, arguing that it deprived the police of an important to tool, but they lost at the Court of Appeal as well. And the Court of Appeal decision is fascinating. So I would put there were a lot of different issues and I put them in two categories. The first category is the common law power for random stops. And then the second category is the statutory power on the common law power. The court of appeal actually found that the 1990 La Duce case did not recognize the common law power of police to make random stops, which is really interesting because we do treat this as a power at common law. The police have long acted as though they have this power. What the court in this case said was that the Deadman case from 1980 only recognized this ancillary power in the context of a ride program and that La Duce rec considered a statutory power con to conduct random stops. So it actually didn't expand the principle of Deadman to say that police have the power outside ride to do random stops. 
So the Court of Appeal is essentially calling into question whether or not there even is an ancillary power to conduct random stops, which I think may be contentious. Uh, I don't really know where I land on this. It has been a longstanding police practice to act as though they have this power. Uh, so I think this will be an, an issue. The court also held that the, the Court of Appeal also held that the lower court could reconsider the precedent from La Duce, which is a, uh, I think, nearly 30 year old now Supreme Court precedent. Uh, the, the Court of Appeal here said that racial profiling is a new reality that fundamentally shifts the parameters of the debate. I actually don't know that racial profiling is a new reality. It seems to be a long standing reality. Um, but what the court here said is that current literature and evidence presented uh, pr provides a picture of the situation that differs from the situation described by the majority in La Duce, while the risks of racial profiling and traffic stops with no required grounds may have been contemplated when the ruling in La Duce was handed down, they were not sufficiently known at the time. I think all of this is going to be fodder for the Supreme Court if this case gets there. Now, the second basket of issues relates to the statutory power to conduct random stops. And on that, on this statute, on this statute that allows the police to do this, the Court of Appeal found that it does violate Section 9 of the Charter, which is arbitrary detention, and it violates Section 15, the equality protection, and that it can't be justified under Section 1. The Court of Appeal found that the statute permitting random stops gives rise to racial profiling. It contains no criteria or standards that could guide the work of police officers in selecting which drivers to stop. There are no objective reasons nor any parameters that could steer them in the exercise of their discretionary power. And the evidence showed that even though the statute does not expressly authorize traffic stops with no required grounds based on racial profiling, it necessarily has the effect of allowing racial profiling to permeate the exercise of police power it confers. And interestingly, the court said that racial profiling often results from subconscious conduct rather than overt racism. So a lot of really, really interesting issues being raised in the case. I'm interested in this idea that um, it, it may be the lack of criteria or standards to guide police officers that could be part of the problem. So uh, perhaps there could be some modification to the random stop. Um, uh, just, you know, spitballing here. You can only stop like one in, you know, 50 vehicles. You can't just like randomly select a vehicle. Uh, something to actually ensure that the stop is is actually uh, random, not just <laughs> like here's a 22-year-old black man. Uh, let's stop him, uh, which is what Luamba uh, said was happening to him. Um, Josh, your reaction to any of this, aside from, uh, you know, you being a, a troublemaker <laughs> in, in your youth. <laughs> um, I think it's a super interesting case. And I'm glad you talked about it. Uh, I think your idea that if we're going to do random, it needs to genuinely be random, like, you know, one in 50 cars or whatever, that makes a lot of sense. You know, it reminds me of when you're in the airport and um, you go through and the thing beeps and you have to like get your hands tested for uh, bomb materials or whatever with that little swab. That is genuinely random, right? I think they do it like one in five or one in X number of people has to do that and it's selected by a machine. It's not selected by a human. And that takes care of that, that, that serves the same, you know, genuinely important purpose of like preventing bombs from getting on planes without singling out people based on on things like race so that's that's a good idea i also it's a fairly um unpopular opinion but i'm pretty skeptical of the idea that even like ride programs are um necessarily constitutional because there's no reason to you know there's no there's no cause there's no reason to be pulling people over and you're you're interfering with their liberty, especially I mean, like they've when been they, upheld. They were upheld. They, they have. It's just an unpopular opinion that I have. <laughs> they shouldn't have been upheld. Like they, I'm sorry. Like I, drunk driving is a huge problem, but I think mm -hmm. the way to tackle that is like much longer sentences than people currently get, rather than you know holding up thousands of people for like the last road pro program I saw in Toronto like held up traffic for an hour, and I had places to be, and I'm not. There's no reason to suspect I was 
you know, drunk driving. When I hit that ride program, it wasn't like I was coming from an area where there's like a lot of known drunk drivers. It's weird. I've almost never seen an actual ride program. I well, in Toronto, they're the rare. Country. Yeah, yeah I, I only ever see it in the country. Yeah. yeah, they're really common outside of Toronto. In Toronto, I saw one and it was um, like just getting onto the garden or it was like it was just the absolute worst. I was going to say that sounds it. like like getting onto the gardener is already like, you know, kill me now. I can't imagine. It's already an hour. I know. Yeah. <laughs> so but I mean, in principle, I just don't like the idea that police have a, a random random stop power and uh, skeptical of the whole the whole thing. So, Joanna, what do you think? Well, yeah, I mean, I disagree with you. I do think that there's at least a rationale for just like there should just be this constant undercurrent of nipping at your heels that you could be asked to uh, stop and uh, blow uh, blow a, a breathalyzer. Having said that, I think this is a case where AI can really help. Like, I actually think we should delegate this to machines because I don't think human cops are capable of behaving in a truly random manner. And there's all kinds of evidence that racialized cops are even more racist uh, <laughs> than, you know, the non-racialized ones. So I think that like the airport model might work well, where it's just like, click, 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 boom, you get randomly stopped. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, people have subconscious biases and people are very, very bad in every domain of life of acting, um, of, uh, you know, acting contrary to them. And one funny story that I just remember talking about Josh driving around as a teenager, this didn't happen to me, but my brother, when he was like, and I, he definitely doesn't listen to this podcast. When he was, I think, 14 or 15, he would like take my dad's car and drive it around our little like suburban type neighborhood. Or I think in one case, he took my grandma's car while she was in like Miami for the winter and just like drove around and a cop stopped him because obviously he's like a 14 year old kid. And uh, he got in huge trouble, but the cop also checked the car and the car had my grandmother's hollow knife in the trunk. So the cop was like, what's this knife? And my brother was like, it's my boobie's hollow knife. Wouldn't that <laughs> knife be like a serrated bread knife? It's like a big serrated bread knife. <laughs> For some reason, I guess she was like driving to shul or something and she left it in the trunk. <laughs> Anyways, my brother got like taken in the backseat of the cop car, taken home. And my dad was in the driveway and he got into huge trouble. So, but yeah, not a random stop to stop a 14 year old brat from driving around with a hull knife. Don't That's do that, funny. kids. You will. I, they, I question, they will. Keep. I question whether that was a legal search of the car. Maybe. Yeah. He, maybe he gave them permission. <laughs> he's fourteen. And my brother was so dumb. You never say anything. Don't talk well, to the cops. <laughs> that's easier said than done, right? Yeah. Okay, let's take a break, and then we can do Joanna's um, headline this week. Okay, so mine will be a little bit of a lighter, in a way, headline, although I do think that this is an entryway into a discussion of the direction of equality law in this country and the ways that we see it endlessly, the endless sprawl of equality and discrimination claims uh, under human rights tribunals and the courts. Um, so this is the story of Tracy Obstniak. Uh, I may have butchered that. She is a library staffer in Victoria. And she is alleging that her employer, uh, the Greater Victoria Public Library Board, discriminated against her on the basis of family status by changing her work schedule in a manner that, quote unquote, interfered with her childcare obligations and refused to provide her with reasonable accommodation. So a little bit of a background. Uh, in 2019, uh, Obsniak was working as a library assistant, um, and the hours that she was working was 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., which worked for her um, because she could pick up her child at 5.30 p.m. Then the library shifted to a schedule that worked better, apparently, for uh the, the library going public, which was a 10 p.m. start and a 6 p.m. finish. And this was a problem for Ms. Obsniak because she could no longer pick up her kid on time. And she was only able to make alternate arrangements uh, with her family for two of the five work days. So she requested a modified schedule to work from 9.15 to 5.15, which was denied by the library. And instead, the library offered her 
an interim solution, which is that she'd be allowed to leave work early on the days that she had to pick up her kid for three months. And she was expected in that three month period to find alternate childcare that would allow her to resume work until 6 p.m. So three months go by and Obstnik meets with her employer and says she was unable to find any aftercare program that was open past 6 p.m. And the employer said then she could leave early without pay. So I guess get an hour less of pay per day or use vacation time um, to pick up her child until September of the year of uh, that year. That fall, um, she met again with library management, said that she had exhausted all options. She still couldn't find a solution. Um, in the meantime, her stress was negatively impacting her health. She went on one month medical leave. Um, then she came back in January and the employer at this point said, you can either stay in your permanent position, work the required shifts from 10 to six, um, or quit her role and take an on-call position, which would be a significant uh, reduction in pay. Then of course we come up to COVID, the library is closed from March to June. So presumably that worked out for her. Um, and then once the library reopened in summer of 2020, she stayed in her job and had occasional scheduling conflicts. But at this point, and we've been waiting for this, her common law partner, not sure if it was a female or male partner. Um, oh, no, it, it is a male partner. I see now the gender pronoun. He was able to get a new job that allowed him to help out with picking up the child. Um, so she brought this as a complaint before the BC uh, Human Rights Tribunal. Um, and uh, it was it is uh, going to proceed to a hearing. A tribunal member, Teresa Etmansky, said that she was not convinced that the Victoria Public Library had considered all of the options for accommodating her childcare obligations or that working requiring her to work the standard 10 to 6 schedule was absolutely necessary to library operations. Um, she was also not convinced that uh, requiring Opsnik to take un to un unpaid leave was not causing undue financial hardship or that her failure to arrange alternative childcare was just a matter of having sufficient time to search. So basically the argument being made here is that you have a right to have a work schedule that fits your childcare pickup needs um, and that your employer has an obligation to accommodate this. And look, I actually, I have sympathy for this woman, sounds like uh, a difficult situation, um, but I think the claim that your specific employer, because of course there are other employers, there are other jobs that have different work hours if your childcare situation really is so inflexible. Um, it's not like you have no choice. The whole point of charter rights is situations where, situ where the state is putting you into a quandary where you have no choice. Uh, and, you know, you, you can't uh, mitigate the situation at all. Clearly, in the context of employer-employee relations, it's different. Um, but we also have to ask whether the disadvantage that she's asserting is caused by um, the behavior of the employer or if it's caused by factors that are really beyond the employer's needs. So here, if, you know, the undercurrent to this She's alert, asserting discrimination based on family status, um, but there's strong suggestions in the initial tribunal di dis discussion that this is really about um, adverse impact against women who are generally primary child caregivers. That's not, you know, a gap that either the state or an employer can be expected to fill. And Josh, when we talked about this case, you said that you, and maybe I'll let you talk about this, uh, in a moment that you had written about this in law school and said, if you look at Frazier, which is the case we've talked about a few times about female RCMP officers um, and uh, what their ineligibility to a full pension because they took a certain amount of time um, off for childcare and maternity leave, ineligibility for a full pension, um, and that was found to be adverse impact discrimination. I looked at that case yesterday and the dissent from Brown and Roe, where they say something that I think, of course, we're talking about a human rights case, but 
Clearly, the same principles have crept into that context, which, again, is not a state citizen relationship. But they say substantive equality has become almost infinitely malleable, allowing judges to invoke it as rhetorical rhetorical cover for their own policy preferences in deciding a given case. And this departs from the rule of law. And so equality law and discrimination law particularly must be concerned with state conduct that has the effect of worsening pre-existing disadvantage. So it's certainly not required that a discriminatory law be discriminatory on its face. It can be facially neutral, um, but you have to be able to show that the law itself worsens disadvantage. Um, and neither the state nor an employer can be said to have an obligation to socially engineer all of society so as to remove all inequalities. That's actually kind of evil if you think about it. And so here, the inequality in question appears to be that the librarian or uh, library admin has to leave work by 5 p.m. to pick up her kid. And at least for a period, the burden in her family dynamic seemed to fall on her and not her male partner, who seemed to take like a year and a half to clue in. Maybe I should try and work out something with my employer as well. Um, but that, you know, that's to do with the dynamic between the librarian and her partner. And her employer doesn't have an obligation to uh, catch the fallout from that. And by the way, the same dynamic, uh, the same so-called disadvantage would apply to people who have to take care of uh, elderly family members, uh, same sex couples where one partner has primary child care needs um, or somebody who has to go home and feed their dog. Um, so uh, we'll see where this goes, but we're seeing this spill over and this just sprawl of equality law in all domains. Um, it's a little bit uh, disturbing. Josh, you want to talk about your law school pa paper and did you get an A on it or did you get canceled for calling out <laughs> the insanity of some of these positions? Um, so yes, I did get an A in that paper. I did not get an A in that class, though the exam kind of threw me for a loop. But um, I was basically saying that post Fraser, uh, you're going to see this be the next frontier because in Fraser, the idea was that, okay, the RCP has created a special program to recognize that, you know, women um, might need to job share, they might need to work part time because uh, the reality is that childcare falls on on women more than it does on men because you know, society is not not fair in that regard. Um, and that, you know, this would so this would be basically become the next frontier and you, you would see this these types of claims more and more. Um, but to me, why why that's wrong is, uh, you know, first of all, you know, they could just eliminate that program entirely. And then apparently that would be constitutionally compliant it's, instead of trying to accommodate um, women in, in the RCMP, um, but not going far enough for the court. Um, but also because I think the key to um, equality that we that we keep getting away from and that Fraser actually uh, did, did purport to change is, um, it's only discriminatory in my view if there's something arbitrary going on. So in this case, if the employer can accommodate that, let's say it is discriminatory in the sense that um, it really does, you know, create a difference between her and say male colleagues or her and colleagues that don't have childcare. The question then becomes is, is it arbitrary in the sense that the, the employer, um, can't, can't, could just accommodate her, but is choosing not to because she is a woman or because she is a parent in that case, to me, that's discrimination, but if there's any bona fide reason why the employer has to shift your schedule, which I think there was here because they're trying to serve their clients better with different hours, then it's not discrimination. And Fraser got sort of got rid of the arbitrariness requirement for discrimination, which was a huge mistake. And then uh, Sharma, a couple of years later, this was like the fastest reversal of the Supreme Court in all time. They essentially mm -hmm. said, okay, arbitrariness is not always going to be required for discrimination, but it pretty much will be in most cases. It's a very good indicator. And that, of course, was really pertinent in our uh, case about whether or not math is racist. This is one of the arguments we made is that arbitrariness is usually going to be an indicator. And 
in that case, it wasn't arbitrary for the government to require, you know, teachers to pass a math test. Um, anyway, so I think the key to this is, is arbitrariness. And I don't think that uh, this claim is necessarily going to succeed, but we'll see. Uh, Christine, what are your what are your thoughts on this? So I feel bad, you know, judging this woman because I have three kids and I also have a very flexible schedule where I can go and pick up my my kids when I need to. Um, but I also so I, I'm not I'm not judging that this is a real need. It, it clearly is. Um, but there seems to be like this opening of the floodgates, especially post covid um, I have a I have a friend who is in senior management at a large institution, and he has. I have a couple friends in these types of roles, and and they have told me about the number of people that have come to them, especially post pandemic, saying when when there has been the the return to work that every hurdle has been thrown up, including people who have said, um, "I can't even make the one day a month." requirement of in-office work Be and and the justification in that case was on family status it was um a, a, a an employee who had told this friend of mine uh i can't leave my 12 year old at home alone because the, the police will be called so if this if if accommodating schedules on the basis of like you're a parent is a human rights complaint like we're doomed. Like everyone <laughs> is going to never come into work again because requiring anyone to go into work is now apparently a human rights violation. Um, if anyone wants to see the most like frustrating hair pulling, causing uh, descriptions of why they can't go into work, check out the Reddit forum for the public sector, Ottawa public sector workers who give all of the reasons why they can't make the the new in-person requirement work the re like it's hard it's to hilarious it's hard to believe that they're real people cite uh there isn't a gym near my office okay like <laughs> it's too bad or my dog has separation anxiety and that's the reason i can't go in like i don't know i'm just like concerned with how people are interpreting what is discrimination in the context of trying to find any reason not to go into work? That said, of course, I do understand this woman's not like I don't think that her uh, her situation is a um, is an easy one. Like I do understand that that's a challenge, but it is such a common challenge that like all of us have busy lives with demands on our time. Um, we all are expected to make it work, so I don't think it's discriminatory. Which uh, reminds me, Josh, we have a call today in the early evening, and I will have to take that from the road because I have to go to my grandma's retirement home. So I hope you can accommodate that. I think I think I can accommodate that. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. I have elder care obligations. I guess we'll turn now to our bad legal takes. So mine goes to Twitter, a Twitter user named Zoe, and I'll give the context here. So police have arrested and charged two individuals for mischief related to an anti-Israel protest that took place on March 7th. The allegation is that these individual protested at a private business at Young and Eglinton in Toronto. I, I'm, I'm told, although it hasn't been reported, I'm told that this was some type of like a venture capital fund and that this happened on a day of action against banks because I don't know. Uh, banks and Israel are connected somehow, um, <laughs> according to some conspiracy theorists. Mm -hmm. So anyway, there was this day of action. These individuals protested at a private business. They entered the business and they prevented an employee from going into her place of work. The employee feared for her safety and the suspects, police say, wore masks to conceal their identity. And so they have been charged with mischief against property and another charge called disguise with intent and disguise with intent is a specific charge in section 351 sub two of the criminal code. And to prove that charge, police need to show that the intent was to commit an indictable offense uh, and the person had their face masked or colored or is otherwise disguised with the intent of committing that indictable offense. So 
Mischief to property is a hybrid offense. It can be charged either as indictable or summary, depending on the circumstances. But and and so the allegation is that the, these people in committing mischief to property wore a disguise. They wore a medical mask. And the key thing here is that the police actually need to show that these accused people were masking with the intent to disguise themselves to commit an offense. Um, you know, I, I don't know how they're going to show that. Uh, but for example, they might be they might have video evidence, for example, of the accused person putting a mask right uh, on right before committing the alleged offense. So the police need to prove it. It's not just automatic that wearing a mask results in a charge like you don't get charged with uh, disguise with intent because you entered uh, Joanna, you entered your grandmother's uh, retirement home in a COVID mask. You need to have intended to commit an indictable offense while wearing that mask with the intent of disguising yourself. Um, so that's what this Twitter user, Zoe, seems confused about. So here is her tweet. Um, she retweets this charge uh, from the police uh, that says these individuals have been charged with disguise with intent. And she says, Toronto police are out of control. These Quote, suspects were wearing medical masks like so many people continue to do because they're COVID cautious. This is fascist. They're really grasping here to arrest and target people. Defund TPS, Toronto Police Services. <laughs> so I just like, don't know what level of cr credulity you need to be operating at to think that these people were just like really public health conscious, that they just put on COVID masks because that's what they really care about. Uh, maybe they do. The, the onus is on the police to prove that they were wearing the COVID masks to commit an offense. But, you know, I would I have I have seen posters for pro advertising for protests where they say on the poster, wear a COVID mask. Police are watching. When I went to the U of T encampment to do a tour, when I went inside the encampment, this was the anti-Israel encampment, there was a big sign inside the encampment that said, uh, wear a mask, police are watching, something along those lines. So, I mean, Zoe, I don't, maybe it's possible these people were wearing COVID masks the whole time, uh, that they always wear COVID masks, the burden is on the police to show it, but I, I have my doubts. <laughs> so the police are going to be the ones that have to show it. But I just think that the whole idea that it's about COVID cautiousness is a little bit strained. Uh, Joanna, what's your BLT this week? So my BLT goes to the city of Toronto, um, who have decided to hold back on a proposed ban on e-bikes and e-scooters, who are th which are those little motorized bikes that are all over the city of Toronto, uh, a ban uh, which was proposed on bringing these bikes onto the TTC, the public transit system of Toronto. And that has been put on hold until TT sta TTC staff have determined how such a move would impact gig workers as well as racialized and lower income riders. Um, so the concern about bringing these e-bikes onto the TTC is that they are made with lithium batteries and fluctuating temperatures, particularly as we go into winter where you could go from like minus 30 into the TTC is usually like pretty, um, pretty, uh, pretty warm in the winter um, can cause condensation um, and lithium plating, which increases the likelihood of short circuits and fires. Um, obviously, there's no way to verify these bikes. People just bring them in. Um, and my bad legal take is the supposition that this is about, again, targeting racialized people. It really wouldn't matter if these bikes were all uh, ridden by white businessmen. If there's a risk that your bike is going to blow up on the TTC, even if it's a remote, remote risk, uh, the TTC, you have the right to regulate that. Um, and this, this uh, attempt at woke backpedaling could literally blow up in your face. Sorry, bad legal take. Josh, also what's a your very BLT? bad, also a very bad pun. No, I liked it. It was. <laughs> I mean, I was mixing metaphors there a little bit. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, I like if this. you've if you if you've seen the fires that these have already caused on the TTC, I think you might feel a little bit differently, uh, committee. 
Anyway, my BLT goes to BLT All-Star Arif Arani, who's the Federal Justice Minister and Attorney General for Canada. And this was in response to a news release from Ontario Premier Doug Ford, who's calling for some very, very strong bail reforms. I'm guessing this is because there's probably an election coming up in Ontario and people are very concerned about crime, understandably. Uh, these proposals of Doug Ford's would you know, ask the federal government to restore mandatory minimums for serious crimes, which the federal government has removed, remove bail availability for offenders charged with murder, terrorism, human trafficking, intimate partner violence, drug trafficking, criminal possession, or use of restricted or prohibited firearms and robbery, robberies, for example, carjackings and home invasion, invasions, mandating a three strike rule requiring pretrial detention for repeat offenders so they're not allowed back onto the street to commit more crimes before their day in court, uh, bring back restrictions on who can get conditional sentences for serious crimes so dangerous criminals receive sentences that match their actions and require ankle monitors as a condition for a bail for serious crimes. Oh, and remove credits that can be applied to sentences for time an accused spends in jail before trial for repeat and violent offenders. You know, these are these are very, very serious uh, measures. And I think there are some obvious constitutional issues involved here. Some people have pointed that out. Uh, bail obviously is a protected right under the charter and it's there for a reason, which is that we don't want innocent people uh, locked away uh, awaiting trial if we can avoid it and for as little time as possible. But where the bad legal take comes in for me is, you know, not just some of some of the possible constitutional issues with the proposal, but Varani's response to this. So he says, quote, these proposals are divorced from any evidence that they reduce crime or that they meet charter standards. The three strikes proposal is a slippery slope. First bail, then what? We've seen the impacts in the US. Incarceration rates have exploded, but there's no evidence that it reduced crime. And then he word study that I didn't read. Like, look, I don't even need to read this study. I think if you do things like what Doug Ford is proposing, obviously you would reduce crime. And that's because criminals are usually repeat offenders. They're a pretty small group of people. And the more time that they spend in jail, the less time they're on streets committing crimes. And I think this is this became obvious during the pandemic when a very large percentage of people in jail were let out um, as a result of COVID rules that tried to increase social distancing in jails. And then we had an explosion of crime at the same time. So bad legal take to Justice Ferrani. You know, you might be right that aspects of this proposal are unconstitutional and it's something I definitely want to look into a bit more, but I don't think anybody's buying the fact that taking criminals off the street wouldn't lead to lower crime. So that's it. That's the show. As usual, we will ask you to rate us review us and subscribe and you can support our work by subscribing to the ccf's youtube channel by following us on x by visiting our website the ccf.ca and by signing up for a freedom update newsletter the ccf is a nonpartisan legal charity funded by your donations so please do click that donate button on our website if you can thanks for listening